and thank you for joining us today. I'm Anne Alison Mackay, I'm Professor of Design Systems at the University of Leeds and this morning we'll be reporting progress on a UK Research Council funded project called Design Configuration Spaces. We'll go to some slides soon but at the end of the session, the webinar, we've got a panel session and if you've got any questions please type them into the ask a question button and we'll come back to those at the end of the webinar. So can we have the slides please? So the webinar is called Simpler, Quicker, Better. And really it's around how we improve the engineering design process. And the project is on design configuration spaces, which is around how we manage multiple bills of materials and other design descriptions within the product development process. Next slide, please. So we'll start with this brief introduction, and then we're going to demonstrate two pieces of software that we've been developing in the project. The first one is um, tools for managing and creating multiple bills of materials for a given design description. And the purpose of that is to improve the quality of the design descriptions within engineering design. And secondly, we'll be looking at a potential application for machine learning, where, where the goal is to accelerate the engineering design process. And finally, we'll finish the, with the panel discussion. Next slide, please. So I'll be presenting this introduction. The purpose of the webinar, next slide please, is to um, introduce some of the research we've been doing and help you see the benefits of having improved design configuration capabilities. We're going to both demonstrate and gain feedback hopefully on emerging design configuration tools and then we'll explore potential applications of machine learning in engineering design and design configuration. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about what design is. Next slide. So start, firstly, we can see design as a, as a process or an activity. So it takes a challenge of some kind. Design in the form of design descriptions come out. And there's this cloud in the middle where designers do design synthesis, design analysis and decision making to basically create a response to the challenge. So that's a sort of very creative and um, organic process. But within an engineering design process, we can also take a, a business process perspective, which is shown on the next slide. So this is an example from one of our um, partners. But the key point is the inputs and outputs are the same. So a challenge goes in and designs come out. But this is a stage gated process. So the emphasis in what I would think of as a product development process lies in managing the design process that managing the process through these different stage gates. And again, the design activity happens between lots of different gates, but we have this business process through which we manage the progress of the development process. So if we move to the next slide, we can look at what um, a successful engineering design process looks like. So in essence, we've got three key performance indicators. So we want to create the best quality possible, and obviously that depends on our sector, the regulatory environment, customer requirements and the like. And we want to do that as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. So we want to maximise speed and minimise costs. But we don't only want to do that in the design process, we want to do that through the entire life cycle process. So on the next slide, you can see we've got the same histograms, but through the entire process. So what we'd argue is a successful engineering design process basically has the best quality, it's as fast as possible and as cheap as possible at all stages of the product life cycle. So if we're applying this for the whole life cycle, in engineering design, we need to make trade-offs that ensure the best performance across the life cycle. And we do that using a range of methods and tools. And each method and tool typically works on its own design description which often includes its own configuration of the design process. So for this reason, if we want to improve the quality of the design descriptions through a design process, what we need to do is have ways, or one of the things we need to have, is ways of managing and working with multiple bills of materials and other design descriptions. So in the next slide, we're going to move on to a demonstration of the software we've been developing. It's called Strembed, so if we refer to Strembed, that's what we mean. And essentially, it's a tool for creating and managing multiple design descriptions. So if we move to the next slide. 
is I'm going to present the to talk over the demo and my colleague Hugh Rice, who's a research fellow on the project, is going to be driving the software. So Hugh's the person who actually developed the software you'll be seeing. On the next slide, we'll show you the case study that we're going to be using. So in this case study, which is a, any of you an engineer will know, it's not an actual real product, but it's a test case we've developed. And we have an assembly bill of materials on this slide. And it's based on the assumption that the product, when it's being manufactured, is assembled a lot in a vertical direction. So we start with the lower body. So the torch contains the lower body, the bulb assembly, which contains the lens retaining ring, the lens, the bulb and the bulb housing. Once that's been put into the lower body, we put the upper body on top of that. And then finally the fasteners that hold the whole, hold the whole assembly together. If we go to the next slide, we can see a different bomb, which would be used in a maintenance process. And in this case, the maintenance process we've selected is changing the bulb. So if we're changing the bulb, the torch body with the upper body, the lower body and the fasteners are one unit which we don't need to interfere with in the disassembly process. But to take the to change the bulb, we need to disassemble the bulb assembly and we do that along the axis of the torch. So you can see that we have these two different bills of materials that dis relate to the same design of the torch. So if we go to the next slide, we can show you the the, the, um, the way in which we're talking about configuration management. So in, in configuration management, there are basically three different types of configuration management. One's around managing change, one's around managing product variety, and then the one that we're focusing on is how we support different life cycle processes. So here, the goal is to provide design descriptions that are tailored to support the needs of specific life cycle processes, such as manufacturing, maintenance or repair. So if we move on to the next slide, what we're going to show you is how we can use Strembed to start with an assembly bomb, we then import a second um, description of the product and reconfigure the assembly bomb into a dis disassembly bomb. But what you'll see is that the descriptions are linked to each other, so the two bills of materials we cre create are connected to each other. So if there's a change in one, it's possible to see how that changes in the other bomb. So we've got a video in case anything goes wrong, but what we're going to do is run a live demo. So I'm now going to hand over to Hugh, who's going to share his screen with us. So Hugh's opened Strembed, and at the end of the webinar, I'll give you a link. So if you want to download the software, you're welcome to do so. And now what he's going to in do is import a, from a step file the assembly of the torch. So he's got a torch assembly and within the step file it's got the manufacturing or assembly bill of materials I showed you earlier. So the first thing we'll have a look at in the in the screen is if you see in the top left hand corner we've got a tab called assembly bomb and Hugh's going to rename that to be the uh, torch assembly bomb. So there are different regions of the screen. The first is the assembly tabs that we've just looked at. In the middle and the bottom is the 3D viewer. So this is a, provides a view of the shape model that came from the step file. And if you select parts, they'll be, they, they appear shaded. So what Hugh's going to do is select some parts and you can see how the um, view changes. On the left-hand side, you can also see um, the parts list view. So you can see the parts Hugh selected have highlighted in the parts list view. And again, Hugh can select some of those parts and they'll appear in the geometry view. And then the top middle region is what we call the part selector view. And that allows parts to be selected based on their geometry rather than the name. So if, that if we tick the boxes, Hugh's going to tick the boxes to the left of some of these parts and they appear in the selector view. And now we can click the images in the selective view and they'll appear shaded in the parts view. So the point of Strembed is to main, maintain consistency across multiple bills of materials of the same product. And we do that with a mathematical structure called a lattice, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen. The lattice represents part-whole relationships in the bill of materials. 
and the lattice view gives a visualisation of the part-hole relationships in the bomb. So what you can see through those red lines are the part-hole relationships in the bill of materials that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. The use of the lattice ensures consistency across the bombs within the editor. So Hugh, as you can see, Hugh's going to point to the lattice view and it's generated from the part structure in the step file. And each bomb is described by this collection of arcs in the lattice, which represent part hole relationships. In it, we can see red lines, which are from the assembly bomb, and the blue lines show the, the little dot dots, the elements of represent parts, and then the blue lines show their relationship to the bottom of the lattice, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And as you select parts in the other views, you'll be able to see how the parts in the lattice change. So this is because the lattice is connected to the other views that you can see. Some of the features in lattices are important parts of lattice theory, but it's not necessary for users to know about them. These include the horizontal lines that you can see in the lattice view, which are related to the number of components in the bill of materials. And the top and bottom points, so at the, in the which come from the mathematics of lattices, which are needed technically for the mathematical operations on lattices that are going on in the background, which users don't need to know about. The reason we're doing this demo using the test case is so that you can see the lattice. We've carried out experiments with much larger um, examples, so for example, 100 plus parts, and can confirm that the approach is scalable, but they result in very large lattices that it's difficult to see. So in this demo, what we're going to do is show you how we can use Strembed to create a second bomb, the disassembly bomb, that's related to the assembly bomb through the lattice. So we're going to start by creating a new tab for the new bomb and importing a step file. So Hugh's going to import the same step file as we use for the assembly bomb. And what Strembed's going to do is, is bring together these two, two lattices. So we have initially a dis disassembly bomb that has exactly the same structure as the assembly bomb, and it's linked to the same underlying lattice as the assembly bomb. So we're going to create the disassembly bomb by starting by creating a new part, which was the torch body that you hope, hopefully you remember from the slides. So Hugh's going to create, select the, the parts of the torch body and then assemble them into the new part called the, um, tor the torch body. And now he's going to collapse that part, which results in the dis disassembly bomb you saw in the slides. So both bombs are related to each other through the same underlying lattice. So if you look in the lattice view, you can see that the lattice has been extended to include the structure that Hughes just added to the disassembly bomb. We'll now go back to the assembly bomb. And as we do, watch how the lattice changes. So if you watch the lattice view, the, the, the lattice for the uh, bomb, for the assembly bomb, it shows now. And if Hughes switches back to the disassembly bomb, you can see it's the same lattice, but the, a different bit of materials is embedded into it. So, for example, if we put some parts in the selective view, so Hugh's going to select some parts. So, for example, that'll include the bulb. That appears in the selective view. And if Hugh now selects the, select, the, the, the bulb from the selective view, you'll see it appear in the lattice view. And now if you move to the disassembly bomb, you can see that the same parts are a set of, or there should be, if you now select the bulb, you can see that the bulb now appears in the shared underlying lattice. So what we hope you can see is how the lattice changes as Hugh manipulates the bombs. In this demo, each bomb was based on the same step file. We're currently working on ways to create a shared lattice when different bombs for the same product come from different sources. And as part of this activity, we'll soon be running a survey, which we're referring to as a similarity study, 
and we'll give you a link at the end of this webinar if you'd like to be involved in that. To conclude this section, Strembed lets us operate on bonds that we know about. From discussions with our collaborators, it would also be useful to be able to work with new bonds that users don't currently know about. Within the project, we're exploring this through applications of machine learning. For example, if we wanted to replace the bulb with a different type of bulb, Strembed can tell you which bulb will be affect, which bills of materials will be affected. But we also want to be able to find possible bulbs that could fit into the torch. And this is one place where we think machine learning can help. So I'm now going to hand over to David and Tom, who will introduce the work we've been doing on machine learning. Thanks, Alison. Um, so I'm, I'm David Hogg, and I'm um, doing research in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning at the University of Leeds. And uh, Tom Hazelhurst is working on the project as a, as a research fellow. We're going to talk about uh, some of the work that uh, we've been doing on machine learning to address the kind of problem that Alison's just introduced. Um, so next slide, please. So taking that, um, that bulb, suppose we have a situation where we have a very large unstructured database of part models, maybe hundreds of thousands of models that have been built up over years, perhaps within a single company or more broadly. And uh, within that database, we know there are many um, shapes for bulbs, there are many bulb models, but they're not labeled. Um, it's not a structured database. We want to be able to find things that look like a bulb that we have already. So the task is to retrieve from this very large database based on shape alone, um, structures that look like something that we already have a model for. So on the left here, we have a bulb. And what we'd like to be able to do is to find those three bulbs on the right hand side from which we can select and then try it out within a, a larger design that we're creating, perhaps substituting for the bulb on the left. So the next slide, please. So the way in which we've been tackling this problem is to uh, find an encoding for the shape of the different part models in our database. Um, and uh, um, a natural way of doing that is to, is to take um, step file encoding of the of a CAD model and uh, in, produce an encoding that uh, represents the face types. So are they planes or cylinders? What kinds of face types do we have? And the adjacency structure between them, the topological structure of the part. So how do the different faces that make up the part um, link together by adjoining one another. And you can represent both face type and adjacency relationships very nicely as a graph structure. So these three graph structures here are the actual graph structures that are produced from these three parts along the top. The node colors represent the uh, type of the face, what sort of thing is it? And the edges represent the adjacency relationships. So two faces are connecting together. So you can see that uh, there's a rather nice um, structure formed from the, stru from the shape on the left there, which has a nice symmetry about it, a rather more complex structure for the shape in the middle. And uh, again, a rather more complex structure for the shape on the right, although there are obviously symmetries in that shape as well. Now, the way in which we uh, um, then use that graph, those graph structures is to map them into vectors, small vectors, short vectors, in our work, we've, we've mapped them into a 16-dimensional vector. We call this an embedding space, a vector embedding of the, the part model. So we map the parts to graph structures, and we map the graph structures to vectors. And once they're in the form of vectors, we can do many, many things with them. Um, the way in which we perform that mapping is to use a, a kind of neural network that's become very popular recently called a graph neural network. And the graph neural network um, takes as input a graph structure and produces as output generally some sort of global attribute for that graph structure or um, just a, a, another graph structure. So in fact, we have uh, our graph neural network is made up of three layers. It reads in a graph, outputs a graph, reads it in again with a different uh, 
different computational outputs another graph, reads it in again, outputs another graph, and then finally computes a global value, which is this vector as output. Now, um, within machine learning, of course, in order to do this, we need to be able to configure the graph neural network. We need to be able to train it. So the next slide, please. So in order to train the graph neural network, we need a large data set of similarities between typical parts, because what we're going to do is we want these vectors um, to be similar when the parts are similar and dissimilar when the parts are dissimilar. So when we embed a part into this vector space, this 16 dimensional vector space, um, it, the mapping should be performed in such a way that similar parts, similar shapes occupy um, positions in the space which are close together. So we need to, in order to train that network, we need lots of examples of parts and the uh, similarities between them. So the way that we've done that, uh, there's a, sp a sparsity of uh, data sets around that, that provide you with that kind of information. But the way in which we've tackled it is to, we've been using a data set called FabWave, which has four and a half thousand part models, and they're grouped into 45 categories. So we use the category label to provide us with a very coarse, a binary measure of similarity. So if you look at these three objects here, uh, we've got a, an idle sprocket, something that's labeled as an idle sprocket, something that's uh, also classified as an idle sprocket at the top, and something that's uh, classified as a hex head screw at the bottom right. So the similarities that we assign to those things are um, the things that have the same classification, the same label, we say are similar um, uh, with a, a value one. So it's a high value means similar. And uh, similarity, if they're dissimilar, in other words, they have different classifications, then we'll give it a value zero. So high is similar, low is dissimilar. Um, now, this actually is, this has worked for us, and I'll sh we'll show you some results in a moment. This very coarse notion of similarity has been able to give us a nice mapping into a vector space for our parts, but it's not really what we'd like. And uh, uh, ultimately, so what we're planning at the moment is an extensive um, data collection process where we're going to be asking people um, how they, uh, whether uh, different parts are similar or dissimilar through a series of questions. So we'll actually be getting human judgments of similarity, which we think will give uh, uh, much more interesting results. So just to show you what we've been able to do with the FabWave data set and this rather um, coarse notion of similarity that we've used for training, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, we've taken a case study of a cake box, which is part of a synth machine from uh, AMRC that they kindly uh, gave us the, uh, the model for. And we've uh, taken the individual parts that make up that uh, um, cake box. And uh, on the next slide, I'm going to show you, once we've trained the, the mapping into this 16 dimensional space using four and a half thousand um, parts from a, a publicly available data set, when we map the cake box into that same space, we get this. So this is actually a three dimensional projection of the 16 dimensional space. So it doesn't tell you everything about the proximities in the 16 dimensional space, but it gives you a fairly good idea of what's close to what. And as the different shapes come round, you can see that uh, similar shapes do seem to be clustered, do seem to be close together. In the far distance there, just going around the back, we have some rings which uh, are clearly similar and then we have some triangular structures some planar structures on the right hand side that Tom is um, marking out and some bar like structures many of which are close together some of which appear to be um, separated by some distance um, so it does actually succeed in mapping the cake box intuitively into similar um, similar vectors the, the parts of the cake box that are similar into similar vectors so what can we uh, use that for? Well, the, the first thing is, is um, the, the task I talked about at the beginning, which is to use it to look up other parts very quickly. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So if we have a part, uh, we can get its vector representation, and then we can look in our database for parts that have a similar vector representation. In other words, the Euclidean distance between them 
if we invert the notion of similarity. So low, um, low values means, means close. So we, um, if you do that, then we look for similar vectors and those uh, similar vectors indicate similar parts. So we can pull out the similar parts and things that are dissimilar where the vectors are very different from one another, um, we can just reject as, as being uh, parts that are too dissimilar. So if we do that, Tom is going to demonstrate now what happens when we um, apply that to the cake box and you can give it a, um, we're going to um, uh, use that to, to look up very quickly uh, using this notion of proximity items from the cake box given a single probe item from the cake box. So it's a very small data set, it's, uh, it's a, but it de does demonstrate the principle. Tom. Uh, so now I'll just give you a, a quick demonstration of this in action. So I have this window here uh, where I can drag a part from our data sets into, into the window. And it just takes a moment to render this part. And then once it's done that, it finds similar parts. So it's just searching within our case study uh, data set. And once this file is rendered, we'll see that it, it will look for the similar parts in the model. So here's the file, here's the file rendered, and the models are just loading there. So it's finding the similar results. So it's just finding which parts are in there, which have the, the shortest distance from their embedded vectors. So you can see um, you know, it's given a ranking to each of the parts, and actually you can see these are all kind of similar parts to the part we put in. Right. Thanks, Tom. Um, so just to emphasize, although it's a small data set, that was done entirely on the basis of shape and not using any privileged information about what those parts were in fact about. So we haven't pre-labeled the parts in that way. The training data set is labeled with class labels, but not the data set from the cake box. So another thing that we can do with this idea is uh, automatic prediction of the manufacturing process that created those parts. So we took uh, the, the, um, the cake box parts, mapped them all into their vectors, and then we built a simple classifier on top of that, which classifies each part into either a casting or forging, um, a sheet metal or a bar or other extruded profile. Um, now, the, the classifier is trained by uh, um, classifying by hand the parts within the cake box. So each of those parts in the cake box is classified as one of these three manufacturing processes by hand. And then we train the classifier on a subset of that data and we test it on the remaining chunk of data. So we maybe take 80% of the data to train and test on 20% of the data. But the left-hand side of this diagram here, the mapping from the model to the embedding vector is fixed. That comes from the training of the mapping process using the 4,500 models in, in, uh, in the data set FabWave. So the only thing that we're training here is the classifier. So we, um, and that's a good thing because it's a very small data set that we're training here. And trying to train it on the base, trying to train the whole end-to-end um, -end chain here on the basis of that small data set is going to be really problematic. We get 76% performance on uh, uh, when we do this on the cake box um, data set, predicting the manufacturing process with 76% accuracy. And the next slide, please. This is showing you, uh, again, a projection of the cake box parts into our embedding space. This time, instead of a three-dimensional projection, we're showing just a two-dimensional projection. And in fact, you can see here that the, the two axes we're displaying are actually the principal components of the cluster of parts in the embedding space, which naturally gives you the certainly one very, very good way of visualizing a 16-dimensional cluster in just two dimensions. But now, 
uh, instead of just showing a picture of the of the parts, we're actually color coding the individual dots here, each of which represents a part by the manufacturing process. And you can see that there is a good deal of clustering of the green, of the red, but then we have outliers as well. And just bear in mind again that this is only a 2D projection of a 16 dimensional space. So um, there may well be um, emergent clusters that uh, we're not seeing here or emergent clustering we're not seeing here. So this is the, um, uh, this is the embedding onto which we build the classifier, giving us the manufacturing process. And uh, next slide, please, Tom. The other um, task or a piece of functionality that we're really keen to uh, explore, and we haven't done this yet, but it's been a major motivation of the approaches that we've been taking, is to provide an assistant for bomb editing. So we've already seen the uh, Strimbed um, system for um, editing bombs. And we see a couple of pieces of functionality that we think machine learning could be very useful in, and that the approaches that we've been taken would provide a route to solving. Um, the first is given a bomb structure, or rather given a list of parts without, a, without the uh, whole part relationships that are, would be contained within a bomb, can we, uh, given a kind of bomb that we're targeting, can we actually assemble those parts into that part whole structure of a bomb? So build a bomb structure from a list of discrete parts. And the second one is something that resonates back with something that Alison was talking about earlier. Can we repurpose an existing bomb to a different bomb structure or a different bomb purpose? purpose? So could we take the assembly bomb and suggest ways in which we could reconfigure that bomb, the same set of parts but reconfigured into a disassembly bomb or a different kind of bomb? So can we learn from a very large data set of bond structures how to uh, assist the designer in proposing edits to a bond structure uh, of these kinds? So thank you. Thank you. Uh, so th thanks very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Robinson. Uh, I'm an organizational psychologist based at the University of Leeds working on this project, along with my colleague uh, Tiziana Kalari, uh, another psychologist and human factors expert. We've been looking at the human and organizational aspects of this project, in particular, the design and implementation of, of software tools like those we've seen. So I'll be running the, the Q&A session in a moment. Um, in terms of some of the research we've been doing, uh, we're not going to cover that directly here, but obviously if you are interested, uh, then, then please do get in contact. Um, so in particular, we've been looking at the, the human and organizational aspects um, related to design configuration tools uh, by conducting um, a large number of expert interviews to find out what their precise requirements are. And we've also been working on the, the similarity project to look at human perceptions of similarity. So how humans detect similarity between different shapes and objects the sort of cognitive process that they're using. Uh, they're not always obvious, particularly with experts. Often experts find uh, these cognitive processes difficult to identify and articulate. So we're running a series of experiments to identify exactly how humans uh, perceive differences and similarities between shapes and objects with a view to informing the, the current and future development of, of these tools. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q and A uh, forum now. So uh, we're delighted, as well as so I'd like to extend a very big thank you to Alison, David, Hugh, and Tom for their, their presentation so far. Uh, we're delighted to also have with us uh, two of our industrial partners. Um, previously, both worked at Rolls Royce, so we're delighted to hear today. So we have uh, Neil Armstrong, who's worked on uh, design challenges in Rolls Royce for more than thirty years, uh, and this included reviewing and approving design proposals development of design techniques, tools, and methods, and leading the skill development of the corporate design population within Rolls-Royce. He's also previously engaged with long-term university partnerships uh, in groundbreaking research into design processes, optimization, and work psychology. So welcome, Neil. Um, we also have Richard Baker, uh, a visiting professor here at the University of Leeds. And Richard Baker also formerly worked at Rolls-Royce, uh, retired in February this year. And he was formerly head of design assurance for Rolls-Royce Civil Aerospace, worked closely with uh, Airbus and the Euros uh, European Aerospace Regulator, ESA. Uh, Rich's expertise includes design processes, development and supply chain management. And prior to working for Rolls-Royce, he also worked for the UK rail industry. So 
Welcome, Neil and Richard, to the panel. Um, so I've been monitoring the questions as we've been going through. Um, we haven't had that many questions, but we have had just a couple come in, I think. So uh, we've got what, what, one here from uh, Robert Gilmore. Um, so thanks very much, Robert. Now, Robert asked this question when we were talking about the, uh, the, the similarity uh, machine learning tools for, for detecting similarity between objects. Um, so presumably, I think it's related to that aspect of the presentation. So Robert would like to know, would this work with welded? So presumably with welded shapes and objects. So we're looking at the, the manufacturing processes. Um, I think probably if I uh, maybe forward that to Alison in the first instance, and if anyone else would like to chip in afterwards. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. No so the, the um, I've actually been through quite a lot of the um, data to the sort of sample parts to look at the, the, the sort of, and basically selecting components. So the parts we're working with at the moment are piece parts. And because they're piece parts, we can look at the overall shape and um, sort of make a judgment around what the manufacturing process is. Because a welded assembly is a, a welded part is fabricated, um, we'd need enough examples of welded assemblies or fabricated assemblies to be able to sort of label them and train the train the machine learning algorithm. But in principle, the uh, there's there's no reason why we couldn't do some experiments with that. One of the things I did see when I was um, cleaning some of the data is that. There are things that I'm pretty sure are welded, are welded structures. And um, in some cases, people actually model the weld. So you can, you can tell they're welded because of the nature of the joints, but in other cases, they don't. So I think in principle, if we had enough examples of welded um, assemblies, we would be able to have a go at training it. Um, I don't know how it would work, but that's the nature of the research. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it's been quite exploratory. Uh, we didn't know that we'd get the cake box parts to cluster, but they did. So I'm confident that we could identify uh, welded structures. The, the slight difference would be that they're assemblies, not piece parts. But mm. in principle, I can't see why not. Thanks, Alison. Sorry, I just noticed the rest of Robert's question actually it was just cut off on the, on the uh, previous yeah. screen. Uh, so would this uh, work with welded assemblies or only piece parts? But I think you, you just answered that with your with um, your last uh, comment. I, I think, think it, it could work with welded assemblies, but we would need to um, clean the data differently, basically. So essentially, we've had some quite big data sets where I've been through and cleaned them because a lot of the data isn't a very, a lot of the shape models aren't of a very good quality from an engineering point of view. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have some more questions, uh, so I think we'll just go through. So uh, one here from uh, Jeffrey Barton, uh, who's a consultant engineer. So uh, there are already many existing commercial 3D shape retrieval systems. So why the need for another one? Mm. Um, David, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. But, uh, you know, what we are trying to do here is to produce a representation using machine learning approaches of the structure and shape of model parts because there's a whole range of things that we want to do and i've, I've just illustrated three of them um you know, classification of, of part, automatic classification of parts into say manufacturing process but also at the end being able to construct bomb structures um, and to do that you need to have um, encodings of the shape and so our, our shape encoding um, opens up a sort of um, whole range of tasks that you could tackle in addition to the to simply looking at part structures, where we where we do where we see applications when there is no structuring of the data set already, so where you have a, a, a very open, um, completely unstructured database of parts into which parts have been thrown, where you need to recover uh, individual shapes. But the, the the work has been aimed not at that single task of part retrieval. It's actually been aimed at a much broader range of tasks where we think machine learning. Uh, can play an important role. Great. Thank you, David. Um, another question here from uh, Tolu uh, Olan uh, Reiju, uh, who is a production development engineer. So uh, would it not be easier to set up the building materials in several sub-assemblies, uh, then call upon the sub-assemblies as needed, or is this essentially what the Strembed software is doing? Um, 
perhaps Alison or Hugh, maybe? So in, in principle, yes. When we, uh, so at the moment, the lattice represents piece parts. And obviously what constitutes a piece part depends upon your perspective. So in principle, we could bring uh, different sub-assemblies into the structure. And in, in the, actually in the bigger picture, if we were actually rolling this out into a real world process, I think we'd have to, because for example, if you had, if you designed a big um, part with lots of piece parts, and then you had suppliers providing sub-assemblies, obviously you, there wouldn't be one description somewhere. So that is something that we're thinking about for the future. Um, at the moment, we're still work, trying to um, think about basically how you would hide things in a lattice. That's the the sort of core problem we'd have. But absolutely, yes, we'd um, obviously what were we? Well, <clears throat> because the in in a real engineering process, there isn't a whole design description. There are, <clears throat> there's a technical data package with different parts defined in many different ways. But um, where we are at the moment is quite early on in trying to reconcile these different bills of materials. Okay, great. Thanks, Alison. Okay, our next question coming up from uh, David Foster. So th this probably has two aspects to it. So I think Alison probably, if you, if you handle the first part, but there's also some potential industrial applications as well. So I might bring in uh, Neil or Richard potentially on this as well if they feel that they'd like to answer part of this. So uh, David Foster says, with, with the Bills and Materials displayer, how do you cope with alternative parts? Example, might, might be a fastener where one part is fitted in the factory, but a different one is fitted in service in the field. At the moment, so, yeah, yes. yeah. At the moment we don't. So, so um, we don't do the, um, that's why, you know, in the, the slide with the three types of configuration management, that's why we talked about the, the last one. So obviously there are loads of complexities around um, what ha how things change through their life and actually whether they're able to change through that, whether they're allowed to change through their life. Um, for example, it's often to do with certification requirements and things, but at the moment, we're literally assuming one description that has multiple bonds. But I recognize there's definitely an issue through life around how things change mm. through their lives. That, thanks, Alison. I was just wondering, uh, did, did Richard or Neil want to say anything potentially about the, uh, the sort of differences between one being fitted in the factory and a different one being serviced in the field, potential sort of implications of that? or? I think this is probably where you see the difference between say aerospace and automotive or aerospace and marine because you know one of rolls royce's great interests in this project was how do you control the bill of material across the whole of the product life cycle through development production into aftermarket and certainly within aerospace once that design has been frozen um post-production engineering change starts to play a role in it and i don't know how it is in automotive for example but a fastener couldn't couldn't change you know that, that would have to go through the whole of the engineering change process which would involve both our customers and our regulators so it would be interesting you know and i'm sort of looking at allison at this point to start to look at where dif different industries diverge you know aerospace is very locked down highly regulated how does that compare to rail or how does that compare to automotive? But you would not be using a different fastener per se in, in, in aftermarket compared to that that you used in production, unless that had been approved by the design organization. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, another question here from uh, Martin Wallace, who's a senior mechanical design engineer. Um, I probably, Alison, maybe Hugh on the software side of things. So, has there been any work on how to integrate the Bills and Material Lattice methodology with existing CAD software using Bills and Material configurations such as SolidWorks? Yes, because the the, um, the the step files, actually the torch was modeled in, in SolidWorks and we exported it to a step file. And the reason the software interfaces to a step file is because that means we can get files from different sources. So for example, the Catebox case study came from AMRC, so that's the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre in Sheffield. And I'm pretty sure they were using um, PTC software rather than um, SolidWorks. But basically the reason we use the step file is because it's a neutral format. Now, Hugh can tell you about the CAD system that's doing the viewing in that geometry view. 
Oh, you can hear me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the 3D viewer is Python OCC. So Strembed's written in Python. So the possibility does exist for it to be integrated into, for example, FreeCAD, which is also written in Python, but integration into SolidWorks isn't something that we've looked at at the moment. But it, it would be possible to for it to be um, reconfigured as a toolbox or something similar in, a, in another piece of software, but it's not something that we've addressed at the moment. Thanks, Hugh. Uh, so another question here from uh, Jamie Steele, who's an IMEC uh, engineer. Uh, I guess looking at this one, uh, probably taps into some of the issues about the commercialization of the software, but uh, Jamie's question was, is the end goal to integrate the methods into commercial CAD software? So perhaps, um, Alison, if you might want to say something to begin with, and I think maybe Neil or Richard potentially, to if you talk about the potential implications for the end users in, in Rolls-Royce and the like. Yeah. So I would just say that the, the as, as a research council research, but basically the software we showed you are experimental prototypes, but obviously our goal. You're mute. Sorry. Um, so um, as a research council project, we're actually working at quite low technology readiness levels. So what you saw are experimental software prototypes. But our goal is to have, once we know what needs to be done, our goal is to have those, that, that capability included in different uh, CAD packages because that's the way they get out into the market for actual engineering companies to use. I'd never recommend you use our experimental prototypes other than to just do your own experiments. But um, obviously what we're doing is developing that sort of underlying understanding that different vendor companies will be able to implement in different ways according to their own sort of strategic goals. Yeah, I'll just uh, add a bit. Um, I think some of the capabilities in the software, when they're integrated into CAD packages, can work with other subroutines in CAD packages to add uh, quite an a, um, impressive amount of functionality. So, for example, if you, if you wanted to enhance the degree of automation in... Uh, compiling configurations or to examining um, service and maintenance procedures i think there's a, there's a significant potential for that um, when you look at how it would uh, work in in conjunction with uh, cad packages thank you very much um, so next question here from asim uh, tufik imam uh, who's a senior assistant director uh, so, hi, I'm a product design engineer. What sort of design approaches do you recommend to make a product lifecycle assessment, uh, plastic and sheet metal products in particular, to reduce the environmental impact? Thank you. Perhaps, uh, so Richard or Neil, perhaps from the industrial side, maybe to start with? Um, well, I think uh, whenever you're considering um, any design, um, you start off with a set of requirements and um, much more so nowadays, some of those requirements will relate to environmental factors. Um, then the design process where the designer is trying to, to um, specify and configure the design will take those uh, requirements into account and um, examine and analyse um, the impact of those factors. Um, so I, I don't think it actually um, reflects on configuration management per se, but um, I think one issue that I have touched on in, in my lifetime quite a lot is the, the, the data that you incorporate into a configuration management uh, da database um, may need to be expanded to include um, more types of data. So, for example, we went through a phase of eliminating asbestos in some of our products, um, but it was very difficult to trace back through which of, of many tens of thousands of parts had an asbestos content, particularly if they were assemblies. So I think it does pose a few challenges, but it's, it's sometimes it's, it's difficult to do with uh, historical databases. Mm -hmm. It's worth probably also bear in mind that um, when you look at Alison touched on uh, a document called the Design Technical Data Package, 
and that will include instructions for end of life disposal and there will be reach declarations against particular components within an engine for example and that leads you straight back to configuration control what is the configuration of the product and what is the impact of reach on say a compressor blade or a turbine blade because of you know the substances that have been used to coat that for example so it's definitely got an application particularly when it comes to end of life disposal thanks both uh so another question from uh, david foster so uh, in bills of, bills of materials how do you cope with consumables uh, for example glue is often used like this and often forms an invisible sub-assembly uh, alison perhaps yeah at the moment, we don't deal with um, consumables like glue, but it's a, a very interesting. And the other one's paint. Yeah, we don't, we don't yet. Um, I think that's actually a broader product configuration problem. We're assuming um, that basically we're using the piece parts out of a CAD package, so we're assuming they're rigid. It's Great. But, it, but, but it's interesting, Alison, if you go back to my previous response, which is that a, a lot of reach legislation will link to things like adhesives and paints, for example, and that is part of the product's configuration at the end of the day. It is, and actually, in terms of sustainability, there's, there are, you know, we, if you imagine a piece part, the sort of a theoretical point of view, a given piece part's got a shape and a material specification, and there are packages that can give you some environmental data around different materials, but obviously when they're assembled, you, you need you need to understand the disassembly processes and how they impact the sort of you know what the, the environmental impact of those disassembly processes is and then that includes all sorts of coatings glues or all, all the things that sort of mess up well, so i think a lot of the um the research that we're doing is, is based around examining shape but it's not beyond the beyond the bounds of possibility to extend that into uh, configured data as well so if you if you have a data file alongside the configuration that includes say materials or even things like customs data which uh, with uh, global supply chain is becoming more relevant you can you can start looking at similarity and equivalence in terms of data as much as shape so I think um, if you had um, glue as a as a, a material within an assembly, I think potentially you, you could uh, handle that. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Uh, so another question here from uh, Cecil Armstrong. Uh, so potentially it's about Strembed. So I think potentially Hugh or Alison for this one. Uh, could you clarify how the lattice is related to an assembly structure or a collection of parts in a step file? So do you want me to, so in a, a step file, we have a, um, there's an, an entity called product definition relationship and one called product definition and product definition relationship and its subtypes <coughs> represent the relation the part whole relationships between parts and essentially the lattice is a representation of those part whole relationships if we can work out which parts aren't decomposed and they're the component parts and they form the bottom level of the lattice and then given a set of parts, it's possible to calculate every possible permutation of how they might be assembled. In a previous project, we actually created that whole lattice, but the problem was it was, it was massive and took a very long amount of time to generate it for a relatively small number of parts. So what Hugh's been doing is basically generating the lattice we need, and then expanding it as new assembly um, as new bill of material structures are defined. Thanks, Alison. Uh, okay, uh, another question from uh, David Foster. So, uh, another version of variety is colour. So, how would you cope with, for instance, red casing, blue casing versions? Alison, maybe? We don't. Okay. Um, I think the previous answer I gave on data, I think, might be able to manage that. Um, oh, I think we, obviously... we, we can add, add attributes. But it's um, if we want to train the machine learning, we need enough instances in a format that can be imported. And if we then go to look at how we what the neutral formats are, we're stuck with step, and essentially that sh shape based and and assembly structures. So, I mean, there are other step models, but a lot of this, yes, we can add it as add them as attributes, but the 
we're not going to, it's, mm. where, the question is, where do we get the data to train the algorithms? Thanks, Alison. Uh, so I think, so looks about, that's all the questions we've had for now. We have got a few minutes left. I, just before, in case we do get any more, um, I'll just chip in just very briefly, just to mention that, that we are, as we mentioned, running a similarity study online, an experimental format where we're getting people to judge um, perceptual similarity of shapes and objects. If you would like to participate in that, then please get in contact with uh, my colleague, uh, Tiziana Kalari, who's, who's running that study. Um, it's, uh, it's an opportunity to have an input into the research and, and your, all contributions will be very valuable and, and incorporate into the model finally. So you'll, you'll have a chance to, uh, to contribute. Um, I think that, that's all the questions we've answered for now. So thanks very much for a really interesting and engaging discussion. And also thanks very much to our panel. Um, so Alison, David, Hugh and Tom for presenting. Uh, Tiziana for also being here on the panel um, and, and, and Neil and Richard for joining us, our industrial experts. It's been a very informative discussion. So thank you very much. Obviously, if you do have any questions after the uh, event itself, um, please do feel free to contact us uh, by email. Um, obviously, there will be both academic and practitioner outputs arising from this research. Um, software prototypes will also be available. So if you would like further information on this, um, our, our website is, is reasonably up to date as well, so various outputs and, and links will be there. But if you have uh, specific questions you would like to ask us, then please do get in contact. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, it's, it's been a very good turnout and a very informative discussion. So I think um, I'll just check if there's any more any more questions before we go. But if not, um, well, oh, 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 well, oh, sorry. Yeah. We've got this last slide. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so please, uh, this is uh, my email uh, if you're interested uh, in uh, participating in the similarity study. We will be launching it uh, at the end uh, of the month. And uh, yeah, it's uh, about what David uh, and, uh, and Tom have been presenting, particularly in assessing shapes by form or manufacturing process. So please get in, touch, uh, in contact with me for further instructions. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. I've just noticed we have just had a couple of couple of last minute questions actually. I think we might just be able to squeeze in. So uh, a couple from Cecil Armstrong, one was a comment. So great, very clear answer, thank you. So positive feedback, thank you Cecil. Uh, and another question from him. Uh, so could you clarify how the lattice is related to an assembly structure? Or oh, we've answered that one already actually, sorry. Um, there was one final one from Adam Thicket, um, who is a Siemens Energy Development Engineer. So. How quickly do you think the search can be made to happen? So once the data set gets large enough, the speed may slow to unusable rate. Is there a way to speed this process up? David, maybe? Or yeah. 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 Yeah, so uh, surely there is, yes. Um, you can use, in, in 2D, you can use uh, sort of quadri type approaches. And, uh, and so it, exactly the kind of thing in 16 dimensions that are computational methods for very quickly finding close by points uh, to another to a given point within a, a, a large data set so you structure the the points the vectors in space in order to do the lookup very quickly so it shouldn't go up uh, you know um, linearly it should you should be able to do better than that great thanks David I just went so I think that's just about it we haven't had any more questions uh, Alison I've just uh, as the sort of project lead would you like to any concluding okay. comments you'd like to finish off with or? Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all the presenters to the people on the panel and to the um, the uh, audience who I can't see but I understand there are quite a lot of you um, and we've put together this slide hopefully you, you can write down um, these details but if you want to know more about the project and we update it regularly there's a website where you can at this URL um, if you want to access Scrembed, Hugh's got an area on um, GitHub and he updates that regularly. So um, as new versions come out, you can watch it on there and actually you'll be able to pick up the one we use today on, on that link. Um, Tom's put part find in this link so you can actually reproduce what Tom did with his own with your own uh, step files. And then finally, as Tiziana said, if you'd like to be interest, if you're interested in our similarity study, um, please email and she'll be uh, keeping a list of people. But I just want to wrap up by saying thank you very much for joining us and enjoy your lunch if you haven't eaten it already. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.